Hello, everyone. My name is Celia Bertoya. I am the daughter of Harry Bertoya. And for the next month, while we are all hunkered down in our homes or home offices, I will be giving a live feed about Harry Bertoya every Tuesday at 11 o'clock. I am in the gallery. I'm the only one here, and I have Cloroxed and cleaned everything umpteen times, and it's just me, so hopefully that's okay. All right, the, the spill cast sculptures came about in the early 1960s, and it was quite a process for Harry Bertoya to decide to do this type of sculpture. Harry normally did not do any kind of uh, molded bronze or cast bronze as oftentimes when you think of a metal sculpture, you think of you know, a statue of the founding fathers and that kind of thing but Harry didn't want to do that. He liked to use the, the metal in a more raw form and similar to what George Nakashima said about wood, uh, he said something about you want to discover what the wood wants to be and then with your human hands help that to come about. And Harry said of metal, you have a piece of metal in your hand and, and you want to shape it and figure out what, what the, best, uh, the, the best iteration of that metal is for the current feeling and the, the metal itself. So I'm going to tell you in Harry's own words to begin with, about the process of coming up with this spill cast process. Well, first of all, we will actually look at a sample of a spill cast. Uh, okay, here we are. Here is a spill cast sculpture. Uh, trying to get the camera right here. Uh, you can see it's got incredible texture and holes. Uh, here's the front side of this one and the back side. Okay, so you have a little taste of what these spill cast sculptures look like. Now I'm going to read from you Harry's own words, just a couple pages here, of how he came up with this whole process. Okay, let's see here. All right. The interviewer is asking about the Dulles International Airport, which was a huge uh, nine panel sculpture that was placed in 1963 in this international airport. And it, it's this type of sculpture, the spill cast. Harry says, a number of things come to mind. Aero, Saarinen, he's talking about, had already passed and Kenneth Roach uh, called me to where they were building the model and making the drawings for the new Dulles Airport and he asked me what could be done. First he presented a scheme which they thought might have some merit and the scheme amounted to really a system of railings, and a wing, a projection from the main ticketing room. Uh, and I thought that was a bit on the decorative, decorative side and began to think my stay there was for a day. And we discussed various possibilities. But then about four o'clock in the afternoon, there was still nothing. I began to feel as if my day wasn't very fruitful, but it required a little more time they should give 
more thought and I should give more. And somehow the thought came of something like a map. I use the word map for lack of any other better word for the moment. But to my mind, it began to indicate the land, the earth. And I said, let me give consideration to this thought of a map. All right, we left it that way. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was asked to visit Osaba Island, which is off the coast of Georgia, USA. I was deeply impressed by the constant battle of the elements. The sea was taking away part of the land, eroding these huge oak trees. Some of them were falling, being denuded, scrubbed clean, and so forth. It was very impressive. I became aware of forces continuing. All right. Also, not long from that time, now you have to consider that English was Harry's second language, and he spoke quite well. He had a, a great vocabulary, but sometimes his phrasing was a little bit odd, probably more like Italian. Also, not long from that time, I visited the Waterbury Mills foundry, and I knew this had a, a great facility for turning out all kinds of ingot and extrusions, and I wanted to look into the possibility of casting something. I had no foundry of my own, and nearby there was a little one, but it was inadequate. So at any rate, coming back to Waterbury Mill, while walking along this battery of 10 or 12 huge furnaces, maybe three or four ton capacity, we came to one where the attendant had made an embarrassing error. He forgot to put on the stop and all the contents were pouring out, which was quite a waste on their part, you know. And they tried to get me away from it. and It was dangerous. And I said, oh, no, no, I'll stay. I, I want that. And it was fantastic. I saw the movements. I became aware of the forces internally, the way things happen inside this globe, great heat, movement, what we see on the surface is volcano eruptions and all that. Plus what I'd seen on Osaba Island, it all came together. And I knew then what I should be looking for. So the casting is the result of those two visits and then a period of experimentation on my own part to find out my limitations. But the object was for it to become something like that. Whatever has to be done had to do with the earth seen from the air. Uh, the actual work went on for quite some time and I became very engrossed because it was a great experiment in tossing a stone into molten metal watching the explosion or preparing some chunks that were different in nature and placing them so that running molten metal would wrap around it and form some other form. This was all along lines of having to contend with forces, temperature. Temperature for one, the liquid metal had to find its way and there's nothing you can do to elevate it from its tendency to remain horizontal. But this period of experimentation gave me enough information to know pretty much what I could do and what I couldn't do. Well, I had to fall into a fairly simple procedure. Of course, the initial thought was that it would be best if it was really all poured. But the second thought meant that was going to be very costly. Uh, it would entail heavy machinery to lift it and so forth. So the budget would not permit that. Uh, the budget for this was $17,000. This is in the 1960s. And he arrived, I, I should say I, as Harry, arrived at that by combining the weight of the material, the cost of the supplies, and how much they would pay me to do it. I, and I had to get it down to Washington. So very little was left over for me, <laughs> but that's another matter. Uh, 
the difficult part was when the flow of the metal had to come about in such a way that it had to register with the next metal, the, the adjacent panel to it. For that reason, I really wanted to do the whole thing in one day, nine panels in one day. Now, mind you, Ghiberti in Italy spent 24 years doing the doors for the baptistry, but he was facing different conditions. <laughs> I was doing something almost as weighty and big in 24 hours. And this, of course, is due to our industrialization. Art is to that point. But my real reason for wanting to do it so quickly was that if each panel was done consecutively without lunch or a night of sleep, I would be involved in the same thought, the same action, and continue for every panel. It, it would have a relation. Everything started early in the morning, and we worked to about 5 o'clock in the afternoon continuously. The two young men helping me to attend to the furnace were exhausted. And I myself was pretty nearly spent, so we called it quits, and we had to do two more panels on the following day. And true enough, I think they show a difference. The first ones are altogether different. But that lapse is not out of character, so it's still fine. Uh, and then I'm going to read just another snippet, which gives you an idea of the, oh, sorry for the, the little camera things here. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Now, another little snippet that came in here was, as Harry explained later to one of his favorite clients, he had seen some of the first pictures of Mars. You know, Life magazine would always have these amazing pictures. He had seen these pictures with cracks and fissures, and he wanted to repeat this hotbed process with his sculpture. Uh, the thing that excited Harry was the fact that these patterns on the celestial bodies were created in moments of impact, which happened millions of years ago, and they remained frozen in time for a very long time. Harry elaborated on the actual process, which involved the firing of two furnaces simultaneously to a temperature of close to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The contents of both furnaces were then poured on a flatbed of sand and manipulated according to the plan during the very brief liquid state of the metal, a matter of minutes. The result is a multicolored metal mural, many jagged holes with an occasional polished bronze highlight. Uh, so I'm going to show you a picture of the Dulles airport panels. Let's see, let's see. There we go. Uh, this is what you see at the Dulles International Airport. Uh, they recently moved it. I'm not sure exactly where it is. It's in a central lobby. I'm sure you can find out. But you can see many panels, and they're all really wild looking. Uh, here is another another piece. This is at the Reading uh, building in Reading. Again, these great holes. And, uh, and now the pieces that we had in Pennsylvania on the property were just outside, just like this, out in the, in the woods uh, with the greenery. And they're so organic. They, they look like they belong there out in the woods. So now I'm going to take you over to the actual pieces. We'll look at them a little more 
in detail. All right. Okay. So this bill cast, you can see. Oh, just it's it's so amazing. I'm trying to get this. All right, that's pretty good. Now, if you'll notice this little piece, it looks like a rose, it looks like a flower. And I'm going to say, I think that that had to be added later. Oops, I see there's a little, some kind of creature's home there. Sorry, buddy. Uh, but these have been outside for most of their life. Uh, you can just imagine the molten metal just, you know, being swooshed around. Harry would take these long handled tools, sort of like a huge rake, and poke holes and swoosh things around. You can see the movement here. Uh, gosh, I'm seeing all kinds of little spider webs. Uh, and it, as he mentioned there, it had to be done in moments, literally moments. Now, you can see the feet. These feet were also added later uh, because it had to be done on a flat surface, on a, a sand surface. So something that sticks out like this had to be added later. But of course, there had to be a way to mount this so, you know, so it could stand on its own. And there was some patina added, the green, but a lot of, a lot of this is just the natural uh, patination of bronze as it ages and being outside and being exposed to rain and the elements. And you can even see now here, I tried to wash it off, but I think it's just a chemical process now. Uh, bird droppings, uh, which have added to the patina. I think Harry would actually be pleased about that. And now this one's a little heavy to handle, but we're going to go to this guy. Uh, this is the back side, and you can see a lot of these the bird droppings have added their patination and the holes. We'll go around to the front side. And it's just this wild, tumultuous surface. This texture is really rough and tumble. Now, one of the things that they talked about with the uh, I gotta get a drink of water there. They talked about with the Dulles Airport installation uh, was back in those days, this whole idea of jets flying over the earth, seeing the earth from above, and you see textures like this. You know, you, you can imagine flying over mountains or the Grand Canyon and you see all these great rivulets and canyons. Uh, and then coming to the airport, you get closer and closer. Here's another great one. Uh, but the coming to the Dulles Airport, usually you would come in a car. Now, of course, there are shuttles and trains and often you park way far away and come in those, those uh, on-site trains. But back then you'd come in a car, so you, you would come closer and closer to the airport and, you, and you'd get glimpses. And just like an airplane flying and you see glimpses of the, the land through the clouds, uh, they had this whole, I'm going to 
I'll read another little snippet of Harry's words. Uh, I spoke with the, the historic preservation coordinator of the Dulles Airport, and he shed some light on the initial construction of the building as well as the installation of the sculpture. This is what Henry Ward said. It was sort of a peekaboo sequence. First, a person sees the airport towers from a few miles away, then driving closer a quarter mile away, and then they're hidden again, and you see them again, then not, peekaboo. Finally, the towers are revealed as you approach from the road. It was like a funnel and then a tunnel, reducing the space to the mobile lounge and then the airplane. And today the metro brings people to the airport instead of taxis. So that funnel tunnel effect isn't really there anymore. But Saarinen himself, the architect who began and then died in the middle of the process, uh, he saw it in under construction and he, he said, I think this airport is the best thing I have done. I think it's going to be really good. Maybe it will even explain what I believe about architecture. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk to you here a minute. The so this historian, Henry Ward, he continued on about the panels, which are entitled View of Earth from Space. How cool. When they installed the panels, it was a huge project. They had huge cranes, padded forklifts so as not to damage the piece. They were so heavy. The Bertoia panels are a valued and treasured part of this history and people enjoyed them. Uh, and in 2012, the panels were cleaned and reinstalled. So, very cool there. Uh, now I wanted to show you this, this guy. Let's see here. All right. Okay, there we go. The Sorry, I have trouble with this camera. Uh, this you can see is an actual rock taken from the forest that Harry threw into the metal while it was still liquid. And luckily the metal encapsulated the rock. And let's see if we can turn this around so you can see the backside. Okay, so there's the back of it. Uh, <laughs> just a plain old rock stuck in a piece of metal. And the patina is great, this green. Uh, yeah, just. And now it looks like the base is some kind of brick of metal in this hole. I'm not sure what that was about. But you can see that this was truly a different kind of casting. That's why they called it spill casting or action casting. Because it was uh, it, it happened so quickly, so quickly, within moments, Harry and his workers had to do all the stirring and manipulating before the metal hardened. Now this particular piece I found in one of our files that it was shown in a 1966 Amsterdam show that Knoll, the furniture company, K-N-O-L-L, -L, put on. They, had mo they mostly focused the chairs 
of Harry Bertoia, which of course are these chairs, the bird chair, the side chairs, the diamond chair. Uh, but this particular piece was shown there in Amsterdam. Noel and Harry had a great relationship for the whole time that they, he only worked at Noel for a couple of years, but he stayed in touch with them and consulted with them for many years. So this is basically the story of the spellcasts. Oh, here's a great little picture of uh, the one on the left. That's the one you're looking at here. And the one on the right is actually going to the, the Nasher Sculpture Center, which is having a major retrospective for toy exhibition. But don't they just look natural? This was on the Bertoia property back in Pennsylvania, probably a little later than this time of year when everything was really green and lush. But all of Bertoia's works were very organic. You can see the side view, it's just incredible. And I must confess that when I was a youngster, just look at this stuff, I didn't really get it with these spill casts. In my young eyes, they looked kind of ugly, all messy and chaotic. Uh, but now that I understand more about the process and about what Harry was thinking and the forces of nature, I think I get it. I think I get it. He was trying to capture the magnificent power of nature, of the natural forces. You know, you see something like this and it's a moment in time, a, a moment that was created by high temperatures, tremendous force, these earthy materials and kapawi. This moment was frozen in time. And can you just imagine Harry's workers and himself, they're sweating and digging these huge rakes around and uh, the temperatures are really hot and, and he wouldn't even let them stop for, for lunch. I think that's kind of hysterical. Ah, anyway, that is the story of the spill cast. Now we'll take a quick look around the gallery. Oh, and here, here's a drawing. Uh, here's a monotype. This was clearly in planning for the Dulles, the Dulles airport pieces. So everything started on paper first, or in, in this case, Things started in Harry's mind and with the ocean on Osaba Island and the spilling of the metal in the, the factory and all that. But uh, the spill cast. Whew. So we do have a few new monotypes hanging up. I love these little fun on guys, doesn't he sort of look like Humpty Dumpty? Uh, we've got a, an early woodcut there. Another early woodcut, Cranbrook piece. So, unfortunately, we are not open. We'll make this. Yeah, we're not open because of the coronavirus. But you can still go to our shop online and buy 
a ring that was very similar to Harry's own wedding ring or a pendant or a t-shirt or a table tonal and we even have some of the monotypes for sale but uh, I hope that you have been educated and entertained with our live feed this morning. I know I've been entertained. I love talking about my father. And if you do a bit of a search online, you'll find some other talks of mine that are posted. Uh, but it's been a pleasure. I wish you the best in this strange time. Please stay safe and uh, stay home. And I'll see you next Tuesday. I'll be doing this at least for the month of April. And tomorrow is April Fool's, so think of some good jokes. Thank you. And oops, I got to put in my mouse here. Goodbye.